Hey, how it says uh, my name, Rich Mahaney, and uh, I'm from Goebbels, Michigan here and serve as an NMRA director at large uh, for a division uh, for the NCR. So, all right. Now I had, come on, change slides. I had thought about other titles for this presentation, like thanks for the tanks and uh, may the tanks be with you and uh, decided, no, we just uh, go with what we've got here. So the, just a simple storage tanks for solids, liquids, and gases. Excuse me. I don't have it on my screen here. Hopefully that's not going to show up. Let me close this down. No. Looks like beautiful wine dot. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, off a of bridge in Houston, Texas. So where did I, how did I? They do petroleum there? <laughs> Continue to highlight it. Or maybe. No, that just added a slide. Right. I guess that's just for our This is what it looks like. Okay, you're driving the uh, recording situation. Yes. So you may have to go back to your main screen. Go ahead and proceed with the presentation. Okay. Okay, just uh, some discussion stuff. And um, to kind of get started, you know, stuff is what we store in tanks. And uh, I kind of break it down as to uh, solids, it could be dust, could be uh, granulized pelletized uh, rocks, you know, there's a variety of different things. What is coal, what is wheat, all that type of stuff. Uh, the second grouping, of course, is liquids, and liquids deal with vapors, uh, as well as uh, uh, liquids with, that are all vapor, and vapors based on storage temperature and vapor pressure. And then gases, we've got, uh, you know, lots of different kinds of gases that uh, fall into these categories. And gases may have started out as a liquid and then changed as they heat it up, so. All right, solids come in a variety of sizes and types uh, it's because of their specific purposes. Temperatures change to make solids, liquids, and gases. That's a, a deal. Vapor pressure is the, is the term that we use to define what is a liquid and what is a gas. And how do I get a liquid to go to a gas is by heating up and uh, dealing with vapor pressure. Boiling point, changing from liquid to a gas also. So again, if you look at tanks that we're gonna look at, you'll see, well, this would work for this, but this won't work for this uh, product and stuff. Cryogenic products, extremely cold. Uh, again, uh, here's the DOT definition, uh, minus uh, 90 degrees Celsius or, or uh, minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit at the standard pressure. And then I just had to mention sublimation, which is something that some of you may recognize and know about, but there is a term, and that is where we change dry ice to carbon dioxide, and uh, there's no liquid phase. Mothballs go from solids to gas, no liquid phase in your closet, and iodine is another thing. There's only a few materials, actually, that will change from a solid to a gas directly, so kind of an interesting thing. Oops, that didn't work. All right. Um, <clears throat> When again, we look at this, you know, what is this stuff being used for will help us determine what shape it has to be in. Uh, is it pulverized? Is it a powder? Is it a liquid? Is it a heated liquid? Um, uh, is it got to be in a gas? So again, we, we look at what's it going to be used in, how does it move, things like that. Now, when we're dealing with uh, our liquids that are have to be heated up, like uh, taking care of a tank car that has uh, uh, oil, a lot of times it'll say on the side, you know, must be heated to, to get the stuff to flow. So again, part of that concern. Does the stuff have any hazards? Again, we list some things out here. Um, it does it, you know, one of the big things is does it not like air or water? So again, you can have a fire. At what temperature does it change from a solid to a liquid to a gas? 
again, looking up chemical information, does the stuff need help moving uh, with either nitrogen or steam to get it out of its container? And does it generate pressure or expand as it warms up? So again, when we look at tanks, that becomes a factor in that process. So again, a variety of different things here. Again, non-bulk containers <clears throat> and bulk containers, there you get the gallonage and uh, quantities and things like that where we talk different. So we're not gonna talk about non-bulk containers in this presentation, like totes and compressed gas cylinders and drums and all that stuff. We're looking at the big stuff, the bulk containers, so. Okay, and uh, what products would an industry need to make or sell? It would come as solid or gas, get something you can think about when you're at home or stored in a tank after being made until somebody purchase it. And what kind of tank would we use to steal our waste products on there? So again, if we're gonna have waste, how do we get rid of it? How do we store it? Is it, is it in a drum? Is it in a tank? What is, is it stored in a tank car? So, so when we look at solid storage containers and, or tanks, uh, again, we typically use uh, you know, the term silos, bins, hoppers, a variety of different things. And that's based on the size of the pieces. And so if we go to some of the examples I brought you, here's some interesting tanks or storage, and uh, you could call them silos. These are cement powder products. So again, have a different situation. This is up in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So, and then you got cement stored like this in uh, Benton Harbor, St. Joe area. So again, a different shape of container, uh, would you call it a tank or would you call it, you know, a, a bin or a silo? And that's your choice to look at. Another uh, cement plant, as we look at these. Another plant with silos there. So again, you look across there and here's the silos and this is storing plastic pellets. So again, it's a solid material, but in a different shape uh, as far as that situation. Are you getting that? that trying to get rid of this meeting is being recorded. All right, some more uh, pellets. This is for Ron Christensen. Here we have corn cobs. So again, it's a solid material but it's in a form or shape that requires special kind of container to store it and to get move it and things like that. So now we got a kind of a round two product. What kind of container would it be stored in? All right, again, getting into the uh, agricultural materials, a variety of different types of, of containers. Again, the, as you drive around and look at what kind of containers uh, store uh, food grade type material like uh, grain and wheat and all those kind of things. You've got a variety of different kinds of, of silos. Some are actually decorative. Okay, there in the background, again, are different kinds of silos. See a lot of these around Michigan, of course. And these are uh, large ones also. I think I took this picture out in Iowa. So again, and these are, have some similar styles, but also there are differences in them. So again, vertical grain silos. And I may go back and reorganize some of these things and, and again, uh, we'll try and get a more condensed. These are all plastic pellets for a company that makes uh, a variety of things. So again, the, the pellets are coming in by truck or they could be coming in by rail car. So here's a rail car unloading facility for plastic pellets. And you see the tanks there. Uh, and again, the unloading process is, uh, could be a vacuum process where you're gonna suck the pellets out of the car and then uh, force them down to where they go into storage tanks. This is down in Ohio, right off of uh, 75. So you can see the train car, the pellets coming in and then they go into the tanks. This is right on I-94 here in Kalamazoo, on the east side before you get to Sprinkle Road. 
All right, here we've got, uh, again, tanks with solid material, and they do show the fire protection hazard concerns. So uh, the red two says it's flammable, and we have a zero and a zero and then another two. Uh, the blue two, two or zero is the health hazard, and the yellow one is the com uh, compatibility. Is it happy being with other products or not? And this is the 704M labeling system from NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. So, and there is another version of this lettering system from the uh, from OSHA as part of the the hazard or the um, international hazard marking system, and they use the same diamond, but they change the numbers to mean something else. So, uh, very confusing as far as that situation. In the world of us in fire protection, we should make that go away. So, and uh, tanks. And tanks. This is over in Battle Creek, uh, just before on the west side of the train station. So again, you're, what are you making and what kind of tank has to be there and what's the material made of that uh, holds the product. So agricultural products, seeds and stuff like that. An ADM uh, facility, this is on Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So you're dealing with all the corn products that come in so they can make uh, corn syrup and ethanol. Again, the round uh, silos. This is over in, um, in Wisconsin, and uh, it's where the badger comes in there. I'm trying to think of the name of the city. Manitowoc, there we go. <laughs> so. That sign's no longer there. I know it, it's, and there's been different versions of it too, so. Again, a uh, container for solids, sand for the railroad engines. Uh, up in Lansing, up until a few years ago, there was a big coal storage facility on the north side of downtown Lansing. So these silos held coal, uh, corn, corn, hold coal, if I can say it, um, for different things on the north side as part of a storage facility and storage operations of a variety of products. And they recently tore these all down. I found that out when I went back to shoot new pictures. And uh, so I did find the picture of the old one and then the, uh, uh, here are the silos in the, in the uh, nice weather. So then we have coal for railroad trains and there's a variety of different styles and shapes that we uh, have here in Michigan for these. So again, it's a storage tank, but it's a silo or a bin or whatever term you want to call it. This one's up in Lansing. All right. Now this is Pioneer Sugar, and I'm not sure if they're storing sugar in the process there or uh, other things as they make it, but uh, this is a sugar plant out in uh, north of San Francisco along the bay, and there's a um, kind of think of the name of the town, but anyhow, there's a huge, beautiful layout, uh, club layout, actually two club layouts up there. And uh, here's where they have modeled that uh, sugar plant. What would this store? Salt. Salt for the roads in the winter. You know, it's another shape of tank or storage facility. And then I, I just shot this the other week when I was going to North Dakota to teach. And uh, again, you could look at uh, corn, or not, well, agricultural products, or it could be cement, a variety of different products uh, that are dry. So again, an example of the, of the uh, ag facility model on a layout. Okay, if we move to liquid storage tanks, now there's a variety of them listed there that, that uh, talks about what they are. And I've worked for a long time to get pictures of all these different products and uh, in the various kinds of tanks. So li horizontal liquid tanks, again, uh, this is fuel and you can see where it says dyed versus dot dyed related to uh, um, the farm equipment, things like that. But again, flat ends, uh, atmospheric pressures, not, that doesn't need any special kind of uh, heating to move it. And again, it's gravity, gravity driven to uh, drain the tanks. So again, same kind of thing, another setup. Here's a combination of horizontal and vertical tanks. 
Uh, if you had something out in a field where you're getting crude oil, these are sample tanks of their product. And we have a number of these in West Michigan here where we're getting oil. This is a, a newer tank. This would be a gasoline or diesel fuel tank and it's double jacket or double walled. So if they have a leak, it stays in the tank. That's always been a big product for years with tanks rusting out and then draining into the property or into the dike and stuff. So if you're gonna do that today, uh, that is built into a double wall tank for the products uh, to be stored and used out of. It's a pollution preventing situation. Here's some more above ground storage tanks. I was out in California shooting some a number of pictures and this was a, a grand opening. This was a gas station and no longer are they allowing uh, underground storage tanks. So everything's up above ground and double wall tanks. Is that a state thing or is that a state? Uh, state. Yep. Yeah. Oops. So again, there's another picture of uh, above ground. And this is the other angle of it. So you got a, got a big cement dike around it and it has to hold the, the products of the largest tank and then you have your tank sitting in it. This is a double wall tank also above ground. So another one and some more above ground tanks. And here you have some uh, vertical. <clears throat> when we talk about these uh, vertical tanks, they would be known as a domed roof or cone roof tank. And that's tied to the fact that if you have a fire and the tank's gonna uh, rock it out of there, it's designed for the bottom to be a release point, weak seam on the bottom, and then the tanks can rock it out of there. So one of the fire protection features. So, so again, here we have uh, our cone roof or dome roof, vertical storage tanks mixed in with the uh, horizontal tanks. Just different angle. Yes. Is the color of these tanks significant? No. Just a branding thing? It's a branding thing. Yeah, and typically we paint them white or silver, and that is to reflect the heat away. If you have a black storage tank, it's gonna heat up, which is gonna increase the vapor pressures and, and that type of thing, so. All right, some more vertical tanks. Here you can see the fire protection markings on them. And those fire protection markings, typically in, in North America, are not on trucks and train cars and stuff like that. But if you leave the United States, you will find those on trucks and uh, as well as on storage tanks. So with the uh, blue for health, red for flammability, yellow for reactivity, and the white for special information. So, all right, here's kind of an interesting tank picture uh, where the tanks are coming out of the building. As I remember, this was a dairy uh, facility. Again, more flammable type products. And this one actually is the dairy too from another angle. So now when we change colors, uh, it may mean something, it may not mean anything. It may just be the type of tank or what the manufacturer decided to paint it or what the customer wanted. So again, cone roof, dome roof. And here you have the, again, cone roof, dome roof, uh, vertical tanks. Here's the loading, unloading facilities here. Yeah. Um, Again, vertical storage tanks. So a lot of different sizes, styles, uh, things like that. Again, when you look at these, you have to ask the question, is there a liquid product? Is there a dry product? Is it pellet, plastic pellets? And again, you'd have to go back to the manufacturer to see what they're making there. Obviously, this is a Pepsi-related product at a, at a uh, Pepsi bottling company facility. So there you had the white tank, but you also end up with a symbol on it. So this, these were down in Ohio and this was liquid wax at a candle making plant. So again, vertical storage, but making, uh, uh, using candle wax for making candles, so. Heated? Hmm? Heated to keep the wax in? Yeah, you'd have to do that. Yeah, so it may be insulated and jacketed on the outside of there. Again, a variety of vertical tanks. 
And we'll talk about the big ones here in just a minute. So, so as I drive around, I take pictures of tanks and I just put grab lots of them up and put them in this program. I'll probably take out a number of these before we do it at the steel mill convention. So again, vertical tanks. And uh, when you look at them and they're not painted, you can see all the steel and you can see the ladders going to the top. So that could mean open roof uh, tanks or uh, just to get up to the top so that you could sample or look down in the tank, things like that. So, all right, so cone and dome roof type tanks, uh, large versions. Again, the ladder is maybe optional, maybe not. Depends on what the inspection process is and the filling process. There you can see the, oops, the dike around it. You have to have a dike that will contain the, the higher contents of the largest tank in the uh, group of tanks. So Now when we talk about uh, open roof tanks, this is a model on a modular layout that goes around the Midwest. And, uh, but there you can look down in and see the floating roof that rises up and down on top of the liquid and the ladder that comes to the side uh, that bring you to the top. So if we go back to this, uh, this is a floating roof tank and uh, it's open. And so again, that, that's what it would look like inside. Now, a lot of times with the open roof tanks, because of weather and rain and snow, they'll put a geodesic dome over the top of it. And it's not got any real weight uh, standards as far as what can it weigh or what can you stand on and things like that. It, may, it might be if you stood on top of it, you go through it. But again, it's to protect from rain and snow and ice uh, so it doesn't get into the tank. So, oops. So again, here's a large one. <clears throat> again, open roof. You can see the, the stairway going to the top. And the red pipe there that goes up is fire protection from a foam system that there'll be a number of foam nozzles around the top of the tank. And so when you have a floating roof tank on fire, then you're going to dump a lot of foam into the, there's a little space between the roof and the wall that you want to fill with foam. But if it get, if your tank roof falls in or tips in, then you got the whole surface on fire and, and you work that with foam. So coming out here to the road by the, the fence are the foam firefighting lines to pump the water and foam up the, two, up the pipes to the top of the tank. Again, open roof. And again, uh, the code system there and the colors aren't right. But again, the tank does tell me I have 375,000 gallons of diesel fuel in it. So that's the measurement. All right, here's an open roof uh, tank with crude oil. And then when you look into this group here, you've got open roof, you've got geodesic domes, and you've got smaller tanks that are uh, cone roof or dome roof type, depending on which term you want to use. So geodesic dome, and again, open roof. Again, open roof, geodesic dome. Again, another version of geodesic dome where they've uh, fitted this material on top. The dome. And then here's some uh, tanks in the background here where they've insulated and uh, it's a, a cone roof, but the ladders actually go across the top and things, a little different design. All right, this is what's called a vapor dome roof tank. And the design of this tank is as you have the product in the bottom and it gets heated up by the sun or some other heat source, it increases the amount of vapor you have. So the vapors go up into this dome area on the top and are gathered and collected there instead of out sending them out to the atmosphere or whatever. So it's a little different design. You don't see a lot of these out there, but it's known as a vapor dome roof tank. I took, I took this picture in uh, Portland, Oregon, as, uh, as I was trying to upgrade the number of vapor dome roof tank photos I had. So this is over by uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and this is called a lifter roof tank. And what's unique about it is that you see the flag up there, that's uh, to tell us vapor and wind direction and stuff, but see right below it is a ladder. So that tank root or that tank sides will go all the way up 
to where that ladder is. That's how, when it gets full and vapors, it rises up to there and then it goes up and it goes down as the product is drained out of the tank. So uh, it's known as a lifter roof tank. All right, fire protection systems, we mentioned already, you can see the pipes here by the fence line where we pump water and foam, concentrate together, it goes all the way down to the pipe and then up to the roof line to drop in. And there's various store, various types of, uh, of fire protection uh, nozzles to, to make that water and foam concentrate in the aerated firefighting foam. So another thing you can add to your layout if you want it. Here's some examples. And again, it's gotta go all the way around the tank to get the foam to where you want it. And yes, there are storage tank fires, uh, typically hit by lightning, could be something else, but lightning is a big one. And, and again, they're massive fires once they get going and spread. And it's a real challenge for fire protection experts to put these things out because otherwise they're just gonna, as the liquid level drops, the walls are just gonna melt and collapse. And you can see in the bottom picture in the middle there where the wall has gone down. So not only do we have to fight the fire, we gotta keep the walls uh, cool so they'll maintain their uh, structure and things. So. Uh, this is water. This is actually in Sturgis. This is uh, their fire protection uh, plant water system. So in that building in the middle are the pumps, and then you have two storage tanks of water there. So that's just part of the system. So when you're going around looking, you know, what do we have? This is another fire protection water system. You can see the fire pump building there that's white with a test header on the side. And uh, again, it's a, a for a company to get fire protection in their insurance ratings, they may not have enough water capacity or pressure in the city water system, so you'll have to add this on. Or it could just be a backup system in case they lose city water. Okay, other storage tanks that hold liquids. I found this one a couple weeks ago when I was on my way to North Dakota. This is in uh, Mason City, uh, Iowa, and uh, it's just west of the CP train station. Matter of fact, you can see the CP train going behind it uh, there were the black tank car. But I looked at that thing and I thought, what the heck? And uh, it appears it might even rotate or it may just be stabilized in that position. But uh, it was uh, interesting. I'd never seen a tank like this in that position. Again, drainage is based on gravity. So, all right, if you get up to La Crosse, Wisconsin, and these have been different colors over the year uh, when this, re this uh, uh, beer uh, manufacturing facility was different names, but this is the, considered the largest six pack in the world. And uh, so if you get to La Crosse, you got to go south along the river and then the tanks. And who knows what the brand will be painted before or after these. Uh, down in Kentucky, what do you think stored in this? <laughs> Obviously, Jim Beam. And so uh, again, they put their label on there. And, uh, it's nothing more than a storage tank that will handle an alcohol type product. So you might have to have a liner in there for the alcohol so it doesn't damage the uh, actual storage tanks. Where do they keep the ice? <laughs> all, all around the bottom in the dike area. <laughs> so here's another one from down in Kentucky. And, uh, so again, a lot of times these tanks will be used for advertising purposes. This is the fire protection water tank um, in uh, Ohio where they make uh, tomato soup at this plant there west of Toledo. As you drive along, you see that. And then there's the fire pump building next to it. But again, opportunity to advertise uh, Campbell's tomato soup. All right, and this is kind of interesting and it's a vertical storage tank for liquids. But again, chili with beans, you might think it'd come as a uh, pressure gas storage tank. <laughs> but this is uh, between Rockford and uh, uh, Madison, right on the highway there. What do they make here? Again, Diet Coke products, so, or Coke products. And then you can look at tanks for water for communities, and there's lots of different shapes, sizes, paintings, decorations uh, for these water tanks. And of course, the height of the tank will determine what the pressure is at the bottom and at what the pressure is going into the city water system. So if you need a higher pressure, then you got to put the tank up higher or add a, fire, add a pump to it. Uh, this is over in uh, Illinois across from St. Louis. This is the 
largest Coke bottle water tank, or not Coke, uh, ketchup uh, water bank, water tank. This is a plant that makes ketchup and they shape their water tank into a, a bottle of ketchup. Uh, this is down in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Old Forest. And again, they have used a liquor bottle for their water tower, water tank there. And so if you were gonna do this on your model railroad layout, you could get those little bottles that they offer on airlines and uh, you could use that and glue it up on top of a tower and a pipe and make a water tank. Bruce, somebody's have to drink it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and again, just using the water tank as a industry uh, advertising. So this is a Del Monte uh, plant on California. And the city of Duran, Michigan, again, advertises the railroad features of Duran and stuff. These are water tanks over uh, by, um, in Illinois coming into, um, I wanna say Champaign, but again, water tanks take all different shapes and sizes and uh, the needs, so. All right, another tank that's kind of interesting, these are uh, tanks where they bring cucumbers in to make pickles. And I can remember growing up in Holland, we had the a Heinz plant still there, and it was the lar world's largest pickle factory. And they had the old wooden bins for tanks there. And uh, boy, it just stunk up the city of Holland on the west side. And they finally went to a new tank like this, a plastic tank, and uh, they've eliminated the, uh, the smell. But these are pickle tanks. These are right across the train track from um, uh, uh, Bangor, Michigan. So when the Amtrak from Grand Rapids to Chicago comes down there, these are across the tracks from the train station in Bangor. These tanks are down in um, Lawton and it's part of the, the jelly manufacturing process and stuff. And I couldn't get anybody from the plant there, the Welsh's plant to tell me about the inside. <laughs> I have to believe, you know, they're, again, they're grapes and up on top may be a device that spins a a uh, paddle in there to keep them stirring and things like that. But uh, my old boss from the, my job at the hospital at Kalamazoo used to be the maintenance manager here. And I went to him, okay, tell me about this. No, I can't tell you about it. It's a secret, okay? So I went to the plant, wanted to talk to the public relations people. Uh, well, just give us a, a business card and we'll get back to you. And I've never heard anything back. So I don't know what's secret about it, but it's uh, the Welch's plant in uh, Auton, Michigan. But again, just a different shape with a uh, probably a motor on top there. All right, if you're dealing with corrosive liquids, again, uh, acids or base solutions, you got to have something that will, oops, why did I do that? Um, that will hold that. So here it says sulfuric acid. It looks like a metal tank, but it's got to have to have a uh, an inner lining on it to protect it from the acid. And these are plastic tanks for corrosive liquids either acids or bases in Southern Ohio. So then as I go over here closer, you can see on the 704M placard, it says acid versus base. And then the three for health hazards for people, it's not flammable and there's no reactivity for whatever that product is and stuff. But a lot of times uh, acids and bases will react with other things to cause us more problems. So, yes. What do they make the lines? It's, it's going to be some type of plastic. Mm -hmm. A coating that will go down to prevent the liquid product from getting to the steel tank. So here's the same picture I just showed you from before, a little further back showing the tank cars there that are going to come in and unload there. And this is uh, one of the lines companies used to be here site. Okay. Uh, and they have their own tank cars okay. to, to hold their protected liquid. Okay. So that might be something. You want to yeah. Well, and again, you can look up storage tanks for acids and bases, and they'll give you that information. This is south of, uh, uh, where's the football hall of fame, NFL football hall of fame? Canton. Canton, yeah. This is south of Canton when uh, the division or the rail gang went down to the uh, steam facility down there. All right, here's another un only, a tank, only this would be listed as an underground tank based on the how the top is. It could be a vertical or a horizontal storage tank, but you see on the side of it there, hydrochloric acid. And then again, the uh, 704M diamond on the end saying acid. So.
So in this case, rubber line tank, don't weld or burn because you're going to destroy the liner. Now, when they have the tank cars that are with the liners on them for acids and bases, they do a spark test on them. On a, I don't remember if it's once a year or what the frequency is. And you just take like a flashlight and a, bat, a little light bulb, attach it with one wire to a battery, and then you take the other uh, cable and you attach it in a loop circuit so they just touch it to the inside of the tank car and see if the light lights up or not. High tech stuff, you know, you're just checking the liner and seeing if it's, uh, if it's all there, so. Yeah, well, you got to deal with a liner, you got to get in the tank car, which is now a confined space situation. And uh, that. so here's some more corrosive type tanks. Uh, you can see it's a plastic tank uh, at a site. And here's another version of a plastic tank for corrosives. So if you're building industries, as some of my other clinics, we talk about, okay, what are you going to make? Okay, you come up with a product. Now, how do we make that? What are the things that need to be used to make that? So is it a, is it a corrosive product? Is it a flammable liquid? What is it? And that will determine the kinds of tanks that you need to have outside your facility. So, all right, the, the uh, tank here on the, uh, is, let's say it's caustic soda. So there's that caustic soda tank. So it's an aluminum looking tank on the outside, but it's gonna be lined on the inside of it. All right, this is uh, another factory that uses corrosive. So you can see the tank cars coming in there. If we looked up close, you'd see the corrosive fittings, especially on the first two. And then you can see the uh, storage tanks there that they use. So underground storage tanks, again, we do vehicle fuels, we do propane. So here's an underground storage tank for a gas station waiting to be put in. And these have really changed a lot because the leaking underground storage tanks have become such a huge environmental problem for gas stations. So they had to go to new styles of tanks. Here's some more uh, gas station type tanks. Here they are being installed. Okay, many people have never seen an underground LP gas tank that would be put by your house or at a business or something like that. And again, a lot of times when you go to LP gas dealers, they'll have some of these on, on site stored waiting to go to a, a buyer. So you can see the little pipe that comes up out of the ground there uh, for filling and emptying and stuff, so. Okay, if we have a product that has to be heated, they keep uh, uh, so it'll flow like in, um, for ro roads and various kinds of things. There'll be a storage tank that's insulated heavily and you can see the, there's an outer jacket there so that we can take the oil, keep it heated and it'll sort of flow and then out to uh, where it's either going to a railroad car or to a truck. So here's some more of those facilities. Here's an e insulated tank up in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And here you can see some in the background. And uh, for them. here's a storage facility, insulated tank for those hot products to get them to flow. Here's the uh, loading, unloading facility. At this uh, facility, you can see some tanks in the background of the same color as the building. But again, you're going to use nitrogen, or not nitrogen, you're going to use steam to heat up the tank car so we can get the liquid that'll flow. And then from there into tubing to go to wherever it's going to go. So, okay, when we talk about gases, now we got to again think about what's the pressure of the product going to be in the tank at atmospheric pressures. Um, what's the, the pressure? What's the temperature? Is the product lighter than air or heavier than air? May or may not have effect on the tank. And then are there other hazards with that product that you have to deal with from a fire protection or hazards process? So high pressure tanks, uh, normally, all the ones I've seen are rounded on the ends, and same with the railroad cars for them. So that's one of the quick tricks to learn, is it a pressure tank or not. Again, standard propane type pressure tank. Uh, here you can see a 
another set of tanks, only these are, are tubes and uh, they don't fall into the same category as our fire protection laws related to like the LP gas tank, but the tubes have to make, meet a certain standard to hold products. So again, here's an old anhydrous ammonia tank. Probably the small one was uh, anhydrous ammonia also. Uh, this is kind of interesting. When we put LP gas, which up north is primarily propane, LP gas down south is primarily butane in a tank, does the product worry about or is it bothered at all by whether it's in a vertical tank or a, uh, if we go to this next picture here, um, does it matter to the propane or to the gas, liquefied petroleum gas? And the answer is no, it doesn't care. And uh, so you'll see lots of different kinds of these tanks. I found this one here as one at a, you know, a, a U haul facility or truck rental place and stuff. So the propane doesn't care whether it's vertical or not. All right, this is one from uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. So it's already designed if you have a fire around it and it fails, it will rocket out of there. It's got the fins and the nose cone and all that stuff. So does the propane or LP gas care? No. It just works. Works just fine. <laughs> yeah. Again, another one. And again, a lot of times you'll see liquefied petroleum gas listed as propane up north, and uh, versus butane, which is down south, as the primary product. Because they, down south they don't need as much heat output from their their product. Yes. One is heavier than air, and one's lighter. No. They're all, there's only 12 or 13 products in the world that are lighter than air. Everything else is heavier than air. So when you talk to a chemist, he'll tell you there's 12. If you look at the books, it says there's 13 products lighter than air. And if you remember back to high school, you remember the, the term in a chemistry class, ha ha, mimi? That was a way to help you remember hydrogen, acetylene, uh, you know, the, the different products based on the, the alphabet. So, all right, again, uh, then we get into natural gas and uh, our LP gas, and this is what we're doing with the vehicles. Uh, of course, we have hydrogen vehicles. Uh, and when they first started designing vehicles, they were using anhydrous ammonia because it is combustible. It's listed in transfer and placard, it is non flammable, and it does have a flash point, it does have ignition temperature, it does have a flammable range, but it was the first one of the first uh, products used to power vehicle engines on uh, vehicles when they were designed before they ended up stay, uh, going with gasoline. So now we find out on the market, uh, of course, uh, the variety of sizes or types of gasolines and diesel fuel, uh, recreational vehicle fuel, and then you can also get hydrogen, you can get natural gas, you can get LP gas uh, for your vehicle. So again, just horizontal tanks, kind of interesting. And this one is listed as LP gas liquefied petroleum gas or propane in this part of the country. This is anhydrous ammonia, and it's really hard to tell the difference. Uh, the only way from a, a little bit of a distance is the safety relief devices uh, on those products. So if I go back here, uh, you see the tall pipes coming up there for a heavier than air product. And then here we have shorter piping. And again, anhydrous ammonia will stay on the ground when it's first released until it warms up to the air temperature and then it becomes clear. But you see the small little uh, safety relief devices up there above the O just to the right. So another view of it. And again, you notice that it has a, whoops, it has a green placard on it to say non-flammable gas. And that's not true because it is flammable, it's explosive. And it does have a flash point, does have a flammable range, and uh, has an ignition temperature. But those numbers are just slightly off what the DOT definitions are for this product. So because of that, they can call it a non-flammable gas, even though I know we've killed a firefighter in Shreveport, Louisiana with an explosion years ago. Uh, and in Canada, they use a white placard, and I've talked this, about this before on things, uh, with the number 1005, which is either going to be green or white. In Canada, it's considered a toxic inhalation hazard as well as it's flammable and things like that. So every other country in the world uh, has it as an inhalation hazard, flammable, things like that. In the, in the United States, 
we're the only one that calls it non-flammable. So if you see tank cars coming in from Canada to the U.S., they'll have a white placard on them. The white placard will stay on it throughout the trip in the U.S., doing whatever it's doing, coming to deliver anhydrous or taking anhydrous back. But if it comes from the U.S. with a green placard, they, all those tank cars have to be changed over to white when they placards when they enter Canada. So that happens up in Sarnia, Ontario. So why we can't get the United States to sh shift over to go to the white placard 1005 of the number? Uh, again, it's a Department of Transportation issue. So again, here we have propane. You can see some of the piping that's there. So larger propane. And there are some very, very large propane tanks in the Midwest. Here's some different sizes there. And, oh, whoops. and those are very, very big liquefied petroleum gas tanks as compared to what you typically see or what I've shown you already. All right, these were out in California, in Richmond, California, and uh, our product is carbon dioxide, a refrigerated liquid. So, and they have a lot, carbon dioxide is used in the uh, carbonation process for uh, soda pop. So another view of the tanks. So these may actually have jackets on them on top of the metal tank. This is a natural gas out in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and they have these there. So if they have a failure in their natural gas pipeline system for the city, they can switch into these tanks and it buys them some time to fix the product and stuff like that. Now these are right along the expressway on the uh, south side of the expressway. So this is me taking pictures of them would be a, so, a form of terrorism. What am I planning on doing to these storage tanks, you know? And so you don't stay very long on the side of the highway taking pictures and stuff. But it's out in Des Moines right along the highway. And there's one up in Waterloo also that's like that, Iowa. All right, this is just a facility that I found that again has uh, storage tanks there. Doesn't have it listed on there what they are, what the product is, but it's at an industrial facility. And uh, you can see the red piping there, blue for different things. And a lot of times anything flammable on an industrial site will have a sprinkler system over it to wet down the storage tanks and stuff. So then, uh, this was one I found as I was going to Dowagiac uh, from uh, coming down from Goebbels and then across to, uh, not Dowagiac, um, oh, Cass. And again, it's all gone now, but I followed the truck and I was like, what is that product based on that uh, placard there? And um, finally found these tanks and now they've removed them and the plant's closed. So there it is, dimethyl ether, 1033. All right, again, people paint different things on their tanks for advertising purposes or to have fun. So here's a hot dog. This is off of uh, 294 on the south side, uh, southwest side of Chicago. So they painted it up into a hot dog with all the dressings on it. You can see that right from the highway. Uh, this was going down to, uh, to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, one on our trip to Florida that we did in the winter, and they painted it up as corn. Not only did, uh, they also had a truck painted up that way. Now, as we get into other storage tanks for gases, we get into round ones. And so the spheres are spherical type natural uh, gas uh, facilities. And there's a variety of them. Here's one over by Detroit. And this was out in California. And I want to say it was either helium or hydrogen. It was in the storage tank. It was right next to the carbon dioxide facilities. Here's a, all right, so this is a, a round tank, but exactly not round. And you can see at the top of the picture there, the uh, safety relief devices for a pressure gas type of container there. So it's like somebody put their hand down on top of a round tank and kind of flattened it out. This is called the not noted spheroid tank. And I found this one out in Oklahoma. It's a pressure tank. You can see the pressure leak devices up on tank, up on top there of the tank, uh, a, a little different. I've only seen one of them in my travels in the world. So, 
And again, as we said, uh, they are intermixed with the uh, other tanks. And so if we have a fire, these become big exposure problems. So you may see fire protection systems to wet down the outside or the fire department will be focusing water on those tanks because they can heat up and then they release. So tank colors, is there any, uh, any concept there? Again, white reflects, black absorbs, but again, the company may have a color uh, plan for their tank. So this is out in, the yellow ones are out in California, they're north of uh, Richmond, California, as you're going up to Sacramento. So again, painted tank. And if you don't know it, uh, what's the name of the city there as you go down to, in Ohio, but this is the, that's where the inventor of the current American flag was. And I've seen him do his presentation. He's the one that did, entered it in a contest and won. So they call, um, oh, it's south of Toledo. I uh, can't think what it is there in 75, but any, anyhow. No, no, just like that. Brain dead, senior moment again. So, uh, and that's also the home of Speedway. And so they have these tanks there too. Dayton? No, north of Dayton. Um, Fin Finley, Finley, Ohio. These are both in Finley, Ohio. So, again, advertising. And a long time ago, they had these uh, rising tanks that would expand up to put natural gas in, and uh, as they made it. And so that was a, a large deal years ago but they have since are gone away with a lot of that stuff. But here's an example on somebody's model railroad and Walters used to make a model of that. So. Particularly used where they made coal gas. Yeah, coal gas was a big product that was stored in them. So, okay, cryogenic tanks, again, extremely cold. You can kind of make them out. If you glance over, you'll see those fins on the outside where we take a, a cold liquid and warm it up to make a gas uh, for use in the uh, whatever kind of facility it could be. So this one is uh, carbon dioxide. And here's some other products. Again, those large fins uh, are there to vaporize the, the liquid product. And a lot of times you'll see ice all over them. And that's another clue that it's a, uh, a product. So here's the piping coming out of this, out of the storage tank and the, the uh, uh, fins. Uh, so again, you always are looking for the ice on. So again, as I drive around, I see a variety of things. I take pictures. You never know when you're going to have a need for the picture. All right, here's some without ice on them, but again, uh, on, uh, they are cryogenic tanks. Here you can see the fins going up to the side, liquid oxygen. And these are typically liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, carbon dioxide, a uh, variety of different products. Hospitals will have a large uh, system for their oxygen. So, again, cryogenic tank there on the right. In this case, carbon dioxide. And this one was getting a load of fresh products, so oxygen. So a lot of them out there and tied to industry, certain industries. So these ones are on the right, Lindy products. There's the fins. It's a hospital system. And there are places, like if you take uh, I-94 to Chicago, as you're going through Indiana, there, Porter, Indiana, uh, you will see these facilities where they make the, uh, the product. Carbon dioxide. This is another uh, natural gas facility where it's feeding a community. Uh, this was up in Waterloo, as I remember. And again, that's their backup system in case the main system goes down. They can then fill the natural gas, the piping for natural gas from that tank. So 
All right, anhydrous ammonia, kind of an interesting product. These are out in Iowa. Iowa is the largest user of anhydrous ammonia in the, in the uh, United States. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, ammonia is used in farm fields. But the tanks have a little different shape to them. They almost look like a liquid tank. And it is a liquid inside anhydrous ammonia. And then we vaporize it, send it out as a gas, or we move it to a truck. But uh, there are certain places that you'll see these where they uh, load into the tank or offload either by truck or train car. So, so here's a newer tank for anhydrous ammonia. And in fact, I photographed some tanks uh, as I came back in from North Dakota and Minnesota on the north side of the road. So. Now, what kind of tanks are these? Barbecue tank. Barbecue. <laughs> so a lot of people will buy these tanks and then uh, refab them into something else for charcoal and or grilling. So, all right, just uh, we'll go through. Let me see what time it is here. Uh, 11.30. I'm going to go on until you guys say stop here. But uh, these are uh, the typical loading or unloading racks for uh gaseous products, liquid products. So again, uh, nobody makes these that I know of, but you can scrap build, scratch build them fairly easy, so. And the newer ones are gonna have the protective ring around them so that somebody won't fall off the top of the truck or the railroad cars. So this is molten sulfur. Again, uh, loading, unloading. Uh, this is anhydrous ammonia at a farm facility in Wisconsin. This is kind of interesting up by, um, we're, I think we're heading up towards Green Bay where they actually have the, the tank car parks down below and then they got to bring the product up onto the hill. So a little different design if you're looking for something different for an industry. And high pressure car. And uh, in this case, this is out in Gallup, New Mexico, where they uh, park the tank cars on a spur and then they drive the truck over to them and then they either offload or load, whichever it's going to be, uh, from that little spur. This is corn syrup in Battle Creek for Kellogg Corporation. So they, uh, it's across the street from the plant out on the east end of town. So they offload from the tank car to the truck and then over to the plant. So this is corn syrup in La Crosse, or in uh, uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, for the bottling companies there for a pop. They offload in the building that the other cars are waiting. So this was a loading unload or loading facility for uh, used oil in El Paso, Texas. So you just bring the tank car up; it's a gravel parking lot, and then they just offload the trucks into the tank car. So again, just loading, unloading, small lo unloading facility. This is anhydrous ammonia loading, uh, unloading tank car up in a uh, little town. And you see the tank there for the water, so you can jump into that if you get it on you. And then the actual unloading facility is this. And they bring on the liquid in, uh, down into here and then off. There's a storage tank right in the background over there to the left of that car. So if you say, well, I don't, need, I don't want to build a big rack and, blow, and a walking stand and all that stuff. Well, here's an example of what you could do. Just a few pieces of pipe coming up out of the ground, some hoses and a storage tank. So again, other ones. This was a uh, expansion. They were bringing in products that were hot and need to be moved from the hot cars to the storage tanks. And so they had the one inside the fence and then they added a spur outside the fence. So you have one secured and one not secured, same product using steam to get the product out. Here we are changing from a uh, corrosive tank car product to a tank truck. So again, no rack, it's just a you know climb to the top, move some hoses and you're in business. This is uh, transferring carbon dioxide from a storage, from a tank car to a truck at a transfer facility. ADM and, that, and uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, loading uh, denatured alcohol cars. Denatured alcohol again. 
So I, it, there's a variety of different styles for the unloading or loading racks. This is a corrosive product. This is a hydro, or a, yeah, hydrochloric acid up in, or sulfuric acid, one of the two up in Muskegon, Michigan. So, now this looks kind of weird when you look at it, you have these uh, agricultural storage bins here and you got tank cars. So what's the deal, Rich? You know, why aren't these all low pressure, or not low pressure, but uh, uh, covered hopper cars? Well, this is a soybean plant. So they, they're doing soybeans in here and they got the tank cars because once they make the soybean or soy, um, oil, then they got to put it in tank cars. So here's the other side of the plant. Now it all makes sense. Uh, this is molten sulfur, and you can see all the yellow color on the ground there from the sulfur drying up. So if you had a yellow, some yellow chalk from your old days in grade school, you could use that chalk powder to cover the ground where the spillage has been and stuff like that. So this was a uh, out in by Tulsa, Oklahoma at a facility and here you, the only thing we're looking at is a pressure tank car, but uh, you can see the red pipe for fire protection system for the product that's in it. Uh, and this was uh, ethylene oxide, which is very flammable. So this is where they, uh, they offload in by Tulsa uh, an ethylene as a cold cryogenic product. It comes down from Iowa to here and then they offload it and then it's transported by truck to other places. And not much there for loading. Again, ag facility for anhydrous ammonia. And you'd also find at a uh, ag facility, an LP gas unloading facility. And you may also find diesel fuel, off-road fuel, uh, gasoline, and different kinds of storage tanks there because that's the place that everybody in town goes to to get those products. And they really support the ag community. So this was anhydrous ammonia. Propane, LP gas up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. This is over by uh, Lowell, Michigan, and this is where they bring in uh, LP gas and they offload it down into underground storage tanks in the, uh, in the spring. And then in the fall, when they need that LP gas to send out for heating, then they'll bring it back up out and put it back in the DOT 112 tank cars. So it's most of the plant is underground in the big storage caverns where the salt used to be. There's a few buildings and pump houses and stuff there. And I've always said, if you're gonna model this industry, you could do just this part here, put the loading, unloading racks there, the tank cars on train tracks there and a few buildings, or you could go one step further, and as this module that you see at TrainFest, you could build the underground storage tank, the salt cavern, and uh, then you could put some sniff and smell stickers in there and, and have an odor and stuff. But uh, this product may not be odorized at this time because odorants go in just before city gate stations and other things for natural gas, and, and it may be odorized for LP gas here. So, again, another storage rack. I can't remember what product we were doing here. So this is El Paso, they bring in LP gas, and again, they have one side of the fence where it's protected and secured, and then they added another line on the outside so that you have uh, your loading, unloading on two sides. One's secured and safe, uh, and the other side's open to violations and uh, other kinds of people messing with your stuff. So. This was uh, anhydrous ammonia facility out in Oklahoma. They actually make a lot of anhydrous out there. So. This was uh, out in Gallup, New Mexico. There's a refinery out there that actually ships its gasoline products in high pressure tank cars, DOT 112s and, uh, versus DOT 111, re regular tank cars for non-pressure products. And I was told, and I know from the laws, you can always put something in a better package than what you have to per the law. So a lot of times I will, when I was working for BNSF as a trainer in HAZMAT, uh, I would run into uh, DOT 112 tank cars where the LP gas was painted out and gasoline was stenciled on the car. So if you looked at it from a distance, you say, oh, it's anhydrous ammonia, it's LP gas, whatever. No, you got to get close enough to read it's 1203 placard and it's stenciled gasoline on the side. So again, their, their thought process is putting a product in a better container, better package. So, but it can throw people off if you're just glancing. So... Uh, down in Texas, again, loading, unloading platforms. So this was um, just a small facility. And the only thing I really want to point out here is that you have the uh, small dike to contain the product versus having it flow through the whole plant. So this is a 
uh, chlorine over in uh, Adrian. There's a plant down there that makes pellets for swimming pools and uh, hot tubs and all that kind of stuff. And they use a variety of different products to make that, but one of them is, is chlorine. So you had anhydrous ammonia facility in Iowa. And this is loading crude oil out in, uh, in North Dakota. And I spent a few days out there taking pictures, getting thrown off property from my car uh, where they are loading the uh, DOT. At that time, DOT 111s, now they're the uh, 117s and the 120, DOT 117, DOT 120 with crude oil. So some of them are outside like that one was. This is the inside of a building for loading crude. So, and as you drive along the highway between Minot and Williamson, uh, you will see these facilities. So this, they're loading LP gas out in the, uh, just along the highway. Lots of facilities to load crude oil and LP gas out there right close to the highway. Matter of fact, I got yelled at from the, I was going eastbound and this is on the west, north of the westbound lanes and people in those trucks were yelling at me, hey, get out of here, get out of here, you know, so. Okay, so just a few things about getting it right on the on the layout. Uh, again, I have been thrown out of people's basements for these opinions. Um, <laughs> first off, when you look at this scene here, you look at what kind of a tank car is that? High pressure or low pressure? That's an old low pressure DOT DOT 103 tank car. Now the current one is DOT 111. So that's gonna be filled from the top. So the loading rack in front there has uh, filling devices that will fill, gravity fill, that paint car. All right, wonderful, all correct. All right, so here we have high pressure tank cars, DOT 112s or 105s, and again, we have a high pressure storage tank, so that's correct there too. Now, you can always kind of say, Rich, these are just sitting there stored. They're going to do another facility as soon as the space opens up for them, but I have to take what I see right then. So here we get into some more options. We have low pressure loading facility racks and high pressure cars. Those don't go together. And uh, you don't gravity fill a propane tank car. You know, it's all done through hoses and stuff like that. So when you get home, check your own layouts and see what you have there. Uh, here we have uh, low pressure products, uh, low pressure tank cars, DOT 103s. Okay, we're good there. And then we have the right kind of tanks for low pressure tanks or low pressure products in the background there. All right, high pressure, high pressure, we're good to go. All right, here we got the domes or the round ones here. And again, the unloading process for these would not be through a above tank filling uh, system. So this and this may be just on the layout as, a, as nice artwork, but they are not the common things because this is all gonna be offloaded by hose and not uh, filled and filled by hose, but not through an open gravity drop situation. So, so this one's correct. We got uh, 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 low pressure tanks. And then over here, it looks like, uh, yeah, those are low pressure tanks. So that's okay. But I do find hey, Rich, them photograph them. Rich, is close yes. to Nichols. unfortunately, I've got another commitment in a very short length of time. So I didn't want you to see that I signed out and was rude. <laughs> I'm, I'd like to sit, stick for the end of it, but I can't. Okay, well, we're almost done anyway, so. Okay, thank you. Thanks for watching, Bruce. Oh, that was great. I, I learned a whole heck of a lot, I'll tell you that. Okay, well, great. Uh, here's, a, again, a model railroad, and they've got the low pressure tanks. Here's a low pressure tank car, so that's good. Just examples. High pressure tanks, and uh, off to the left there, story, low pressure storage tanks, and we are offloading here. We have both high pressure car and a white uh, low pressure car. So hopefully they've got the hoses connected right. <laughs> but, but that's a high pressure car. And again, we have gravity filling type of loading rack. So anyhow, any thoughts, questions, comments? I know I need to go back through it. This is the first time it's been shown outside my living room and I got some work to go do, which is one of the reasons I asked Kay, can I do this presentation here before I go do it in the seal mill deal? But uh, hopefully you got some ideas. You learned some things about tanks. Uh, comments, discussion, anything before we close up? Rich, I will have to send you a couple pictures. The water tower in Walterboro, South Carolina in the base was the, the city jail for years. So you can okay. store people in your uh, tanks too. 
There's one, there was a water tower over towards Rockford, Illinois, as you headed across from the uh, east to west, that the storage tower for this community also had the fire station in the base of it. So they kept their fire engines in the uh, bottom of the tank. There was a garage there. Mm -hmm. So anything else from the Indiana, uh, Michiana group? Hey, Everybody's yes. Um, I used to work for a company that lined tanks. Yeah. And uh, it was done with a, we did them for acid. We did them for a fertilizer, that kind of thing. It was all done with paint. They would sandblast with a high grit sandblast the inside. And then uh, they of course get cleaned out. And then somebody would go into the tank. And find spaces. And uh, spray a coating on. Uh, some of the coatings would go on like three mils thick at a coat and you'd do four coats. Mm -hmm. Some of them were baked, so between each coat, they would have to be wrapped uh, in fiberglass and then a big blower or heater to bring it up to 350 degrees to cure the paint. And uh, it was glass, it was glass-like after that. Did you ever get to do the spark testing? Uh, no, I didn't do that. They, we had a guy from, um, oh, um, it was a it was a it was a fuel company that was putting tanks out on farms. But anyway, they they sent a guy in to actually do all the testing on on the tanks we lined. Because I would think if you were doing multiple layers on the inside of the tank, that you would have to do a spark test in between each layer to ensure that you know everything's coated and we're not transferring. We can't transfer anything through a electrically through the lining and the tank wall. Yeah, well, that, that I have to t say is, you know, this is back in the 80s, so I don't know what the laws were, were back then, but uh, <laughs> we didn't we didn't do any of that. Uh, but we we were, uh, you know, paid paid a lot of attention to how thick the coatings were. Yeah, uh, we had some some that were for really caustic stuff that were uh, catalyzed urethanes that were filled with fiberglass and would go on about 20 mils thick. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just thought I'd throw that out. Yeah, no, that's all good information. And again, having the opportunity to actually see it be done um, is a that's a great opportunity. So, and there, again, you got to go back and look at what are we putting into this tank or a tank car, and say, okay, what is it? What are its hazards? You know, is it corrosive? Is it flammable? Is it what form is it in? You know, we put carbon dioxide as a liquid into the storage tank, and then it vaporizes out the top as a as a gas as it goes through sublimation, going from liquid to a, or from a solid to a gas is skipping the liquid phase. So you gotta look at all that stuff and say, okay, now that, we got that, we know, now we know what direction we have to go. You know, and again, is sulfuric acid different than anhydrous ammonia? They're both corrosive. One's a base, one's an acid. You know, how does that have to deal with this uh, lining situation? So, but other things. Hey, Rich. Yes. One of the one of the things that um, they used to do in the food industry was um, now I'm going back into the, you know, at the turn of the century. That's the turn of the 19th century. Um, the tanks were wood. Um, yep. Lots of times they were redwood um, and they would put the juices in there to to settle. Um, the, the tank might have been inside a refrigerated room. Um, sometimes they were um, out, you mentioned the, uh, um, the pickle tanks being, those were outside, of course. And so, you know, a lot of the tank storage stuff that you're going to put on your model railroad is, um, it's era sensitive. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, and you, we talked about the wood, you know, with, if we have a, a corrosive 55 gallon drum, all right, plastic lined whatever and it develops a leak what's one of the things you can do to plug a leak well i could stick something in the hole all right well that's wonderful but if it's like sulfuric <clears throat> acid and you stick a wooden plug in there be prepared for the fire that's going to come from it. you can't do wood plugs for sulfuric acid as example in a corrosive container you got to go to some sort of rubber plug or whatever so again i need to you kind of need to think back Okay, so I got the right drum, I got the right thing, all the packaging's right, everything like that. Okay, what if something goes wrong? What do I do now that doesn't create another problem? You know, it's like spraying down anhydrous ammonia with water in a venting situation, you know, make uh, 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 ammonia hydroxide. 
So you got a liquid on the ground. If you spray water on a corrosive or on a chlorine leak that's vaporizing in the air, you now make hydrochloric acid on the ground. And now you've got another problem to deal with. How do you deal with that? Which one takes priority? So again, there's a lot of thinking that goes through all these different deals. What if, what if, what if, to uh, come up with a good plan. But, thank you, Dave. Yep. Tim, you got anything from up in Grand Rapids to present? <laughs> I just, yeah, um, I'm more interested in hydrous ammonia stuff. Um, if you got, I'd like to see some better pictures of loading and unloading huh? stuff. Okay. That can all be done. Excellent. And, the, uh, and again, we, our soil in Michigan is not great and conducive to a lot of ammonia applications. So you don't see a lot of anhydrous ammonia being used in Michigan. And the uh, vendors for anhydrous ammonia in Michigan, in many cases, are a f local farm that has the large tanks. And then the vendors come and pick it up there and take it away. And we don't have the large uh, storage facilities like they do in Iowa and other places. So uh, it's a little different. Our ground does not accept anhydrous ammonia as well as uh, like Iowa. I mean, it just soaks in out there. And so again, it's it's a little different process. And when I was teaching the emergency response in hydrous ammonia up in North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Iowa, things like that, again, you saw differences in, in how much was added to the ground because of the pH levels and various things. So, but Michigan okay. is not real susceptible. Michigan, the primary use of anhydrous ammonia is refrigeration and, uh, and freezing of stuff, things like that, so. Okay, because on, on my layout, I have a model in the town of Ashley, which is on the Great Lake Central now. And there's a big facility there. It's called AgroChem. Yep. And they do mostly anhydrous ammonia stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so any suggestions? I The pictures I've got of it are pretty vague because yep. they're mostly aerial shots. Mm -hmm. So other than going up there and looking at it, I really don't know what they do, but. Well, they're probably selling anhydrous ammonia. Uh, for farmers or two farmers, but also again, it is a refrigeration. So they may be signed to a, an ag facility that's got to freeze quickly the products that come in and then they put it in frozen storage. So it's a quick freezing kind of chemical uh, for that situation. So uh, another big thing in Michigan for anhydrous ammonia is ice skating rinks. And, oh, okay. Uh, you could have an ice skating rink and uh, make anhydrous ammonia deliveries. Uh, from a truck, but the truck has to get it from somewhere so you can have a, a facility along the ramp your track. So, you got, if you, you know, like if you go up to Traverse City, there's a lot of ice hockey rinks and they have leaks and emergencies and stuff like that. A lot of cherry freezing uh, for the cherry growers and stuff like that. So, be creative in your thinking of what could I use or how could I use this product and how do I get it on my layout as a moving it and the, you know, full tank cars and empty tank cars. But, uh, uh, it's all over Michigan, but a lot of it is in ice rinks and, uh, and cold storage facility situations. So. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Rich? Come on here. I understand that a lot of your emphasis is on current procedures. Yep. Because that's your business. But for a lot of us model railroading that model some things in the past, it would be helpful if you can insert uh, when the procedure started or ended. Okay. Uh, to, to help date. In a lot of cases, if you go onto the internet, to Wikipedia, and, and type in history of anhydrous ammonia, anhydrous ammonia use in industry, uh, you will get that early stage there at the beginning of the article all the way up to where they are today. And you might be able to get storage tank pictures on those two kinds of websites. Uh, for it. Or, or if you go to one of the manufacturers, shippers or whatever, uh, you may be able to get some pictures of what they were doing and stuff so like that uh, storage tank that the, that expands up for natural yes. gas yes. that's right next to the highway on the southwest side of indiana of uh, st louis and i'm driving down the highway and I go whoa 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 it's like i get to the side and then shot back because that was one of the few that i had seen in a long time and the other ones i'd seen back before i was doing model railroad seminars right. and uh, you see it out in uh, on the more on towards the east coast pittsburgh philadelphia you know, that kind of thing. But that wasn't too many years ago that I was in Southwest uh, St. Louis and I haven't been back by to see if it's gone now. A lot of that stuff was cut up. So other questions, discussions? 
Anything from you, Greg? Nothing from me, Rich. Nice <laughs> job on the presentation. Very enjoyable. Well, it needs some work on it. It needs some fine tuning, but it, the point of it is to illustrate what do storage tanks look like for these different kinds of situations. And uh, um, so that's kind of where I started from. And, and uh, the steel mill group said, all the stuff that you talk about most of the time isn't going to be of interest to our, our modelers um, in the way of tank cars and things like that on steel mills. But do you have anything on storage tanks? Because we all had those on our steel mill layouts. And I said, yeah, I got some stuff. We can put it together. And then I lost a year because of the cancellation of last year's COVID and, and uh, that type of thing. But yeah. So, well, Joel, acting for Gary, Gary anything, anything else? Uh, I think. Okay. Well, then, uh, if everybody agrees, then we'll bring this session to a close today. Again, uh, Division 9 does not meet on July or does not meet in July or August. I know that we had some conversations about maybe having some sort of a co group trip in Indiana or someplace that. Uh, you know, to look at trains and things like that. So I haven't heard anything from Ron in a while about that situation. I know that now Michigan is fully open as of Monday. Mm -hmm. So that opens the doors to doing things. In Indiana, we, we had a family gathering for dinner in um, uh, Heston, Indiana, because they were the only restaurant that would allow us to all sit together, my brothers and my parents and I, for their 70th wedding anniversary. So the big signs along Indiana, or thank you, uh, Gretchen, for uh, improving our business world in Indiana. <laughs> no, <I know. laughs> so, well, well, then we will continue to contact by our conversations by email and see what we come up with for uh, July and August for maybe something we can do together and meet up someplace that has uh, food, no mask wearing, and trains going by. There you go. <laughs> Good choices. So, all right. Well, you guys have a safe summer, and we'll talk about the September meeting in the fall, which is our joint meeting for our group, and how that may play out with some things that are going on up here. Uh, it may be on a Zoom situation. It may not. We'll just see uh, what happens as we plan it out. And then, again, October is a field trip day, and if you've got people that would like to join us and can be north of Lansing by 10 o'clock Michigan time, uh, you're welcome to, to join on that uh, field trip situation. And as I said, uh, uh, November probably gonna be Zoom with uh, two people, and then December will be Zoom also. So if you wanna finish out the year with us. So. Thank you. Chuck, thanks for your work. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rich. Okay, well, we'll bring this to a close. Everybody have a safe weekend and a, and a uh, good summer. Happy Father's Day. Yeah, happy Father's Day, too, tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. All right.